resources and, and our power.
Always great to be back. So I'll be reading uh, Psalm 119, verses 25 through 40, for those that want to follow along. It says, My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the ways of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. Let us pray. Father, we acknowledge you as the, the one true God, ever-present, all-powerful, and always on your throne. Lord, we live in a society that, that now calls evil good and calls good evil. We've flipped everything upside down, Father, and it seems like these winds that are blowing are, are just too powerful. But, Father, may we cling to the, to the truth that you are still on your throne that you, everything that happens, you either allow or cause. Your sovereignty can never be questioned. And Lord, we just uh, pray that we would take that truth with us as we walk out of these doors. Lord, be with my brother Eric as he brings a word from you. May your words be edifying and convicting. And may we come away from this change today. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Dave. You know, as he was reading through Psalm 119, and um, you guys remember not too long ago, we would read a section of Psalm 119 together as a congregation. And we recognize that, that the Psalms are, are songs, and the Jews sang them. It was kind of their, their psalter, of, their hymnal of choice. And, but, uh, but I also, in case you didn't notice, as David is, not this David, the author David, as... Um, as he's writing this, as he's singing this, you notice he's not singing about the Lord, he's singing to the Lord, so that it, it's really a prayer of David to the Lord. And so it made me think, you know, if you are struggling in your walk with Christ, if you're struggling in your daily devotions, quiet time before the Lord, struggling with having that desire to read his word even, then pray accordingly. And, and pray through Psalm 119. And as you're reading it, everywhere he says, I, just put in your name and pray that to the Lord. And, and I'm, I guarantee you, you pray through that. We know then that you are praying, that we are praying according to God's will. And don't we know that he will answer that prayer? Is that not the desire of his heart? That his people be filled with his word, not just in knowledge, but in our actions and our attitudes and the motives and the desires of our heart to put into practice that which we are learning, that which he is teaching us, so that we may be all that he has called us and equipped us to be. Reminding ourselves, going all the way back to Ephesians chapter 1, when Paul said, that Jesus has given us every spiritual blessing under heaven. Every spiritual blessing is ours. It's not ours to work for or to attain. It is ultimately ours to recognize that he has given us every spiritual blessing under the heavens so that we are without excuse when it comes to living a sanctified, righteous life before our king and being his representatives here on 
this earth. And so with that said, I want to begin this morning. We're going to get to Psalm 19 where we left off a couple of weeks ago, but I want to begin with Genesis chapter 3. And so I want you to go back to the book of Genesis. The beginnings of everything, we understand that. But it's a great segue, what happens here in the garden, in dealing with what we've been dealing with for the last several weeks, and that is the sufficiency of Scripture, that Scripture is enough. That God not only tells us what to do, but he also tells us how to do it. And so I want to begin this morning back in the beginnings there in Genesis chapter 3. So we're, we're, we're at the fall. Adam and Eve have willfully sinned against the Lord, and now they are running away from him. Now, you would think that they would run to him. They would run to him to admit their faults, to admit their sin, to acknowledge that they have done wrong, to beg and plead for his forgiveness, but that is not what they do at all, because that's what sin does. It estranges us from God. It wells up within our hearts a deep hatred and bitterness towards him so that everything about him is repulsive. He is repulsive to us outside of Christ. And yet, in their hiding, God comes. Genesis chapter 3, picking up there in verse 8. God is seeking them out. He knows exactly, of course, where they are. Genesis 3, 8. And they, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Verse 10. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid Because I was naked and I hid myself. There's a phrase there I want you to pay special attention to. Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I heard the sound of you in the garden. Many other translations word it this way. Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden. I heard your voice in the garden. The point being... That Adam's solution and Eve's solution is outside of themselves. They, they tried to provide some means of covering up their sin and their shame with these fig leaves. That is just a weak, pathetic, human-centered way of trying to come up with their own solution to their rebellion and their sin that is demonstrated through noticing their nakedness, and God comes along and he speaks to them. The answer lies outside of them. Of course, we know that the world believes the complete opposite. The answer is found within you, O human being. Follow your heart, pursue your dreams, trust in yourself, so that it's all about self-esteem and self-acknowledgement and self-awareness. It's self, self, self. But God comes along and he says, Adam, that's exactly what your problem is. You're self-centered. You're self-motivated. And you're running away from me. You're hiding from me. You're making some vain attempt to try to cover up your own sin and nakedness and shame. But Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden. And so God speaks to them, and out of great love, he doesn't destroy them. Though we understand from Scripture, the wages of sin is it's death. He could have come with a sword, and he could have just slit their throats, be done with it, perhaps start over. But there, were, there was no plan B. This is all plan A. Obviously, it doesn't take God, by surprise, what has happened here? And so he approaches them, and he speaks a word to them, and out of love, he does hold them accountable. He doesn't just forgive them. Forgiveness is there. But he does hold them accountable, and he talks to Adam, and he talks to Eve. But then 
God doesn't just leave them there. He actually does something about it. He, he speaks a word to them. But, but don't, don't overlook, guys, what has happened here. We, we, just, we just sang kind of the, the little refrain there of, here I am to worship. And I'll never know how great the cost of my sin Will we ever really recognize the cost of his sacrifice because of our sin? And, and every time that we do sin, it's sort of this reflection that mm, it's not that big a deal. Though we recognize that it is, and we do hate our sin, but so often we do give in to it, and we do recognize the cost, but I don't know if we will ever, at least on this side of eternity, really, really grasp the monumental cost of our sin. We know the answer. We know it was the Son of God laying down His life on our behalf. The sinless, eternal, holy Son of God laying down His life on our behalf. And yet, we look at Adam and Eve, and they are nothing but these bags of dust that decided to lift their fist of rage and rebellion against their creator to spit in his face to deny him all that is he is worthy of in order to be independent from him because they thought that was going to be the better way and I'll, I will never forget, there was a conference, and R.C. Sproul, and I think John MacArthur, and there were several men that were up front, and they were taking questions from the crowd. Well, you know, your teacher used to say, there's no such thing as a stupid question. You remember that? There's no such thing as a stupid question. Well, this was a stupid question. And this man stood up. And he asked this group of pastors, do you think God was being too harsh with Adam and Eve when he handed down the penalty for their sin? And R.C. Sproul began to answer it. And then he just said, hold on one second. You mean to tell me that these dirt bags that God breathed life into, decided to raise their fist against their holy, omnipotent, omniscient, all-loving God, and you think he was too lenient? And then here's his, one of his most famous quotes. I've got it on a coffee mug. What's wrong with you people? How would you like to be the man that asked that question? I'd be like, well, he, he wanted me to ask it, so I'm just, what is wrong with you people? Too harsh of a penalty? He, he's there not to, not to destroy them. He came down to redeem them, holds them accountable. There is a price for sin that you and I pay, but the ultimate price we don't have to pay because God would supply that price to pay it on our behalf. That's the wonderful thing about Christianity. It's not a religion of do. It's a religion of done. It's not a religion of cover yourself up with fig leaves. Go be the best person you can. Go find a religion. Be very religious. Go to church every Sunday. Go to Sunday school. Read the Bible. Do all of these things, which we should be doing. But it doesn't cover up our sin and our shame. Only God can do that for us. And so he comes down to the garden. And he speaks to them, but then he also takes, he takes action. He takes action. Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden, but then God gave the lost, these rebellious, all of rebellious humanity, he gave us this promise and he spoke it to Eve, Genesis 3.15. God said, I will... Put enmity, well actually he's speaking to Satan, but he says, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. 
And so in that moment, God made a promise to humanity. I will provide a way. I will provide a solution to your sin and your rebellion and your separation from me. I will provide a solution to your spiritual death, and I will also provide a solution to your physical death. And so God removes from Adam and Eve this woefully insufficient attempt to cover up their sin and their shame. And then what does he do? He takes action and he sacrifices an animal. And through that animal's blood, atonement is made. Not because of some animal's blood, we understand that it is pointing to the Lamb of God. And so God speaks, and when he does, it changes everything for us. So that through his word, he created everything. And David points that out at the beginning of of Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, so that through natural revelation, we are left without excuse. There is a God, therefore a fool says in his heart, there is no God, just like a fool would look at this church and say, nobody built it. How dumb can you get? Yet, humanity looks at God's magnificent creation, which is nothing compared to this I mean, I mean, this building is nothing compared to what he has made. He has made a magnificent creation that we're still discovering, that we're still blown away by. And yet so many people say, there just is no God. They're, they're foolish. And so they willfully exchange the truth of God for a lie. So he speaks. He creates everything. Through what? Through just a word. He speaks and he gives us life. Through his word, he has brought us from spiritual death to spiritual life. And by his word, he will raise us from the dead. And so we lay hold of those truths and we recognize them all. By the gospel, by the written word of God, by his spoken word, he has transformed us from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, he is now giving us spiritual life. Rebirth, Jesus says. It is a rebirth. You contributed nothing to your physical birth. You contribute nothing to your rebirth. He grants it to us. And so we have been reborn by the power of God. And then we also know that by the power of God, that one day our physical bodies will rise from the dead. There'll be a physical resurrection. And so we recognize that spiritual rebirth, physical resurrection, but then the question is, what do you do in between? What do you do in between? We have to to believe rightly in order to live rightly. We have to believe God's truth. We have to believe, we have to have a right knowledge of God. And the only right knowledge of God we can have in this life is this book. It is God's self-revelation of who he is. He has made himself known specifically so that he moves from natural revelation to this specific revelation. This is who he is. And so we give ourselves entirely to it. We are people of the book. And we cannot stray from this. But the straying is happening in evangelicalism In a broad sense, it is happening over and over. It is happening within the Southern Baptist Convention. And the thing that is so tragic and the thing that is so troublesome to me is that deception is so deceiving. I know that that sounds silly. But it is so, Satan is so cunning he, he has these deceitful schemes. There's nothing new under the sun. He goes about it generation after generation after generation. And he comes before the church as he did with Eve. And he says to us over and over and over, did God really say? Don't you know, church, that there's actually a better way? There's something that God is holding back from you that you can discover. So turn from his word. And he says things like, 
here's a deceitful scheme. Pray. There's nothing wrong with praying. And as you pray, wait to hear something from God. Well, let me ask you this. If you're praying and you think God just spoke to you, how do you know that's God? How do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is now speaking to you outside of what he has said? God, what college should I go to? UGA. And then somebody else that went to Georgia Tech says, that was not from the Lord. How do you know that's of God? What mechanism did he give us? The Holy Spirit? No, the Holy Spirit always points us back to this book. And so we got people in the church that are, that are hearing things from God and they're writing them down. This is what the Lord said. Beth Moore, she does it all the time. But then you ask Beth Moore, well, well, well Beth, is that divinely inspired writing? Like, on, as, does that hold the same authority as God's word? No, no, it doesn't. But you said it's of the Lord. You said it's God speaking to you. If it's God speaking to you, then it's got to be on par with this. And if it's God speaking to you, then he's a liar because he warned us, do not add or take away anything from this book. Do not add to it, Beth. And yet people are adding to it all the time. Why do they do that, saints? I'll tell you why. Because this isn't enough for them. It's boring, mundane, Sunday school Boring doctrine. And they want something more that they're not finding. And yet God says, no, it's not that the book is boring, Beth, or anybody else. It's that you have a heart problem. It's that you have a misunderstanding of the character and nature of God. Perhaps you don't even know him. And if you do, perhaps you've been deceived into believing a lie from Satan, that there's more to be had of God. Eve, bite into that fruit, and you ain't going to believe the life that you can live that God doesn't want you to have. He's holding something back from you, Eve. Eve was deceived, <laughs> not, not Adam. To a certain extent, there's a little bit of an excuse there, but there's none. Adam wasn't even deceived. He listened to his wife. I'm not saying men don't listen to your wives. This isn't marriage counseling. But he listened to her. And he knew better. And yet they still did it. Because they sincerely believed in Satan's lie that God is holding back something from us. And so that is why, as I've said before, that the battle for the Bible that the Southern Baptist denomination won in the 70s and the 80s never, ever, ever ends. It never ends. It's always a battle for God's word. And I think that that's one side of the coin, but then on the flip side of the coin is prayer. Those are the two biggies. Those are the two biggies. Because that reveals our heart. It really reveals our relationship with the Lord. How dedicated are you to him? It is seen in your dedication to his word and prayer. And everything else flows out of that. Well, what about evangelism? Isn't that important? Yeah, it's pretty important. In fact, it's very important. But it's not as important as the coin of God's word and prayer. Because if you're not in his word, and you're not depending upon him in prayer, your heart grows cold, you ain't going to be telling people about Jesus. Uh, you're not. There, there's no fire there. And so you just go about your business. Because we can be lulled to sleep. And see, that's the importance of the gathering. That's the importance of you and I having relation with one another. Fellowship, or the code word today is community. It's together, because together, when we're invested in each other's lives, we're encouraging each other in our walk with Christ, and we always need encouragement. But then part of that also is when we begin to go astray, Jesus says, you, you, you leave the 99 and you go after the one. You go after them. And in love and in humility, you say, sister, I, I'm not sure what's going on in your life, but perhaps I'm not seeing this right, but is this true? That's the one-on-one -on -one thing of Matthew 18, right? 
And usually that's where it ends. So then the sister that you think has got something going on and she's going astray, she can either correct your wrong perspective or she can affirm that perspective and then she has a choice, repent or continue. And if she continues, then the church discipline goes further. Two or three go to that sister to, to win her back. And if two or three don't work, then it goes before the church to win her back. And if she won't listen to the church, then she's, she's excommunicated. She's, she's removed from the membership of the church. Not, it's not punitive. It's redemptive. You rescue this lost sheep that has gone astray because we love them. Because we love them. See, God's word works. Amen? God's word, it works. It works. We, if we want to be relevant in this world, we have to rely upon, we've got to become people of the book. We can't just say we're people of the book. We have to live it out. So that we look at scripture and we mean it with all of our heart that it is sufficient, that, that it is enough. We, we believe that it is inerrant, it is without error, it, it, everything about it points us to the Lord, it, it, it is accurate, we can depend upon it, we can, we can depend our lives upon it, we can depend our eternity upon it, it is comprehensive, it is everything necessary for our spiritual life. It is more sure than any human experience that, that one may look to in proving God's power and presence. Experience can be important, but it's not the litmus test for truth. It isn't. We have to take what we think we have experienced and then hold it up to the light of God's word and then be humble enough to say, you know what? What I experienced was not of the Lord. Because here's what God's word says. It's void of flaws. It lasts forever. It's true regarding everything in our lives that matters. And yet the church has become so pragmatic, so driven by fads and business principles and pop culture and psychology and people's personal preferences and their personal experiences, that the church has forgotten the fundamental biblical teaching and the Baptist belief that the Bible is sufficient for all matters of faith and all matters of practice. He tells us what to do and how to do it. God has spoken to man through his word, and saints, he has nothing, nothing, nothing left to say to us. Why? Because his word's enough. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's enough. But you see, the problem that has taken root in so many of our churches, and that has plagued the Southern Baptist Convention for decades, is that on the one hand, we say we, we believe that the Bible is inerrant, and yet, do we believe that it is enough to govern and drive our lives and our churches? Or are we going other directions, listening to the counsel of people who don't even know the Lord or listening to counsel of those that are speaking outside of the authority of God's word. Does God not know how to build his church, saints? Then why do we look? Thank you, Roy. Then why do we look elsewhere? I mean, Jesus said, I will build my church, and it's almost like he's saying, with you or without you. But I will do it with you. And he does it through us. That's what's so amazing. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. The victory is already there. It's already be, been determined because he's sovereign God. As he said, I'm God and there's, there's no other like me declaring the end from the very beginning. The victory's there. He will build his church. And then he said, from every tribe, nation, and tongue. You know what that, listen. You know what that means? This is so popular today. The church is multi-ethnic. Do you know that? It already is. It's multicultural. There, there's like Christians on every continent, 
red, yellow, black, white, and all colors in between, because that's what the gospel does. And yet we're being duped in the church today that, that would look at New Providence and say, you guys are just too white. You need more color. You need more, you need more African Americans and Mexicans and Hispanics and Asians and all of these things. You need to be more multi-ethnic. Well, I can say, well, okay, that's fine. And then, and then they say stuff like, because we, we want the church on earth to look like the church in heaven. Because in the book of Revelation, John looks and he says, and behold, I saw an innumerable amount of people from every tribe and tongue and nation. That's, that's descriptive, not prescriptive. He's just describing. Man, here's the church that has just appeared before me. I think that's the rapture. People agree to differ. But what does he see? <laughs> A multi-ethnic church. Of course. Because the heart in a, in a black person is the same as the heart in a white person is the same. And the heart of a brown person and a red person and a yellow person, all those colors are just stupid. I, have you ever seen a really truly black person? I have not. Or a truly white person? I mean, like, white is your sweater? No. But anyway, that's the language that we use. And saints, there's one race. The human race. That's it. Different nationalities. Different languages, but there is one human race. And the gospel penetrates the hearts of people from every tribe and tongue and language. So don't tell me, church experts, that that church is too black, which I never hear, and that church is too white, which I hear all the time. I mean, seriously. So you, you think some rural church in the middle of a cornfield of Illinois should be red, yellow, black, and white. It ain't happening. I mean, this whole thing is so disingenuous. And it gets us off the focus. The focus is not to save black people or white people or brown people or red people. The gospel's purpose is to save people. They're all sinners. They all need Christ. If they feel comfortable here, praise the Lord. But if they don't, that's fine. Right? I mean, that. that
struggle with it, and David even admits it. Look, I struggle enough with the sins that I know. But there are sins that I don't know. Oh, God, please don't hold those against me either. But he reveals these things. And then we have, and then we have victory. So that, as MacArthur said, we're getting better, but we're feeling worse. That's sanctification. We're growing in Christ's likeness, but we're feeling worse because the more we grow to be like him, the more we see the sin in our lives that we didn't see before. And so ours is a process of repentance. Daily repentance, probably, if you're honest with yourself. Repentance. He is faithful and just. If we confess our sins before him, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And so we turn to the word of God. That's why David said, how does a young man keep his way pure? I have hidden your word in my heart. I've hidden your word in my heart. That's the key. Accountability is fine. And that's good. But the key is the word of God overflowing in your heart and your mind. That's the battle. It's here. It's not here. It's not here. It's here. It's the heart. Because what is here is going to come out of here and here and here and here. The battle is the mind. Saturate our minds with the word of God. The spirit will take it and apply it to our lives. And you will be able to draw upon it when the spirit of God warns you and says, Eric, don't say that. Don't do that. Don't watch that. Don't listen to that. Don't go there. He always gives us a warning. Then we have a choice. Yes or no. Before, we had no choice outside of Christ. It was always, I ain't listening to you. Sin's fun. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to follow my heart. And now we got the Spirit of God living within us, and now we got the power to actually say no to it. But we struggle with that too. So God gives us His Word and His Spirit and one another to help us in this process of growing in Christ's likeness. His Word is sufficient to protect us from sin so that we have been forgiven of both hidden sins that we're not aware of and presumptuous sins that we are aware of. And we ask him to forgive us and to protect us from it all. So we go to the word of God. And fifth, in closing, the word of God is sufficient to protect us and purify us from sin. Number five, it is sufficient to sanctify us. That's how God does his work in our lives is through his word. Look what he says there in verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So that sanctification is both a state in which we are, which we're in, but it's also a process that continues. So that the word to be sanctified means to be set apart. We're saved, we've been set apart. But then he says, now don't live like the world. Live holy lives. So God has set us apart for salvation and for holy living. We have been sanctified and we continue to be sanctified as we grow up and mature to live righteous, holy lives that reflect God's glory and grace. Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, Lord, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So David's great desire was that his life was acceptable in the sight of God that God would be able to look down upon David and smile and approve of his life. Here's the word of approval. One word. Faithful. Faithfulness. That is what God is looking for in his people. It's faithfulness to him. Faithfulness in the small things. Faithfulness in the big things. Faithfulness in the things that people see. Faithfulness in the things that people don't see. Faithfulness when you get credit. Faithfulness when you get no credit. Faithful to his word. Because he comes along and he gives us various gifts and talents. Some of us have ten talents. Some of us have five. Some of us have two. But in that parable... When the two was faithful with two and the five was faithful with five and the ten was faithful with ten, 
and they enter into the presence of God, what does he say to the ten and the five and the two? Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your rewards. He's fair. But he desires our faithfulness. For us to say, we believe in the word of God. And we believe that it is sufficient enough to guide me, to lead me, to protect me, to provide for me, to give me all that I need to live out this life before Almighty God and the victory that he has already given us, that's, that Christ has already won when he rose from the dead and he ascended back into heaven. So we don't just say we believe it, but then as a church body and as individuals, we actually put it into practice and believe that it is enough more than enough. Would you pray with me? Father, we give you thanks and we give you glory for the word that you have spoken to us through, through King David. Divinely inspired by your Holy Spirit as your spirit was upon him to pin these words, every jot and every tittle. And Lord, may we take it to heart as my brother prayed earlier. May we truly be transformed by the renewing of our minds. May we hear what you have had to say and may we now put it into practice. Perhaps we need to go home and, 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 and pray through Psalm 119 because we're struggling with reading your word, memorizing, meditating upon it. We're busy, we don't have time, all the excuses, but there's no excuse. Help us, Lord, to do so. You give us the wisdom through your Holy Spirit to apply it. You give us everything that we need. Everything that we need is right here before us. And so, God, we give you thanks. And, Lord, we repent of all the times when we sought something else other than you. I'm not talking about doctors or counselors or those kinds of things. Running after worldly things, philosophies, worldviews, methods, motives. How we measure victory and success. Looking for people's approval rather than yours. Whatever it may be, your word is enough. And so, Father, we pray for our denomination. And we pray, oh God, we beg of you that you would raise up a man with a heart of compassion and a backbone of steel to be our next president who will lead us in the right direction. That you would give him such clarity as to the root problem of our denomination. And it's not practice. It's theology. It's doctrine. We've missed the mark. We've got to return. And if we don't, this ship will be sunk. And this nation will suffer. Yet, Lord, you are sovereign. And you reign supreme. We recognize that you don't need the SBC to do anything. In fact, you don't even need us. But you so choose to use us to show forth your great glory. God, may we show the glory of God to this day lost and dying world in our relationship with you and one another and our marriages and our family and how we conduct ourselves, our work ethic and everything that your word has a profound effect on every area of our lives. For your great namesake and for your great glory we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful afternoon.